Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we apologize for the delay and, and any confusion. Um, uh, my name is Jen Raskis, and I'm the director of the Israel Action Center at the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. We are proud to represent over 100 organizations and synagogues throughout the region as the public affairs and community relations arm of the Greater Washington Jewish Community. We want to welcome the more than 300 people from across the U.S. who are joining us today for this briefing um, and analysis on recent developments regarding Israel, the U.S., and Iran with the Washington Institute for Near East Policies, Ambassador Dennis Ross. Ambassador Ross is a counselor and the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute. Prior to returning to the Institute in 2011, he served as Special Assistant to President Obama and as the National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region. He was also a Special Advisor for the Persian Gulf and Southwest Asia to then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. For more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealing directly with the parties in negotiations, serving as a point person for the peace process for both President George H.W. Bush and President Bill Clinton. Ambassador Ross will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we will open up the floor for Q&A. At any time, if you have a question, please dial star six on your phone, and you will be added to the queue. Please remember that questions should be kept short and to the point so that we have as much time as possible for as many questions as possible. And as always, a friendly reminder that questions end with a question mark. Please note this call is on the record and is being recorded. Now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Ambassador Dennis Ross. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, there's an awful lot that I could cover that's going on in the region right now. Um, but let me, uh, and, and I hope our, in the, in the Q&A we will get into everything you want to get into, including I think we should discuss what's happening in Gaza. But let me focus on two issues that re as it relates to um, the U.S., Israel, and the Iranians. Uh, the obvious one I should start with is what the Prime Minister revealed uh, the night before last. Uh, he came out and revealed uh, that, that Israel had, in what can only be described as a, a true intelligence coup, had spirited out of Iran uh, half a ton of documents and digital records. I'm having trouble hearing. Can you speak just a little louder? Okay. Um, do you hear me now? Is that better? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, that's better. better. Thank you. All right. So anyway, so let me let me start with the with the issue of, of the revelations about the uh, the Iranian nuclear program. First, let me just deal with the facts. Um, what the Israelis were able to uh, to basically take from Iran was a treasure trove of documents that showed historically what the Iranians had been doing in terms of their nuclear weapons program. And I underscore the word weapons. It is true the Iranians denied they ever had a weapons program. It is also a fact that, in, that they really did have a weapons program. Now, what, what, is not, what was not new in what the Prime Minister said was that uh, they had a weapons program. This was known. This was not a surprise. You know, the Iranians had been... Uh, experimenting with neutron initiators. Neutron initiators are used if you're trying to create what amounts to an implosion that then creates a chain reaction. If you're trying to build an, a, a nuclear bomb, you have to be able to set in motion what is a chain reaction, which then leads to... Uh, the call is breaking up. I'm sorry. It's hard to hear you. Well, I don't know why it's breaking up. I'm... <laughs> Are people hearing me? I say yes or no. I, I mean, I think people. I think it's not breaking up on our end, but it, the volume is pretty low. Is there any way that you can speak a little louder? Um, well, I can't yell into the phone, but I'll I'll try to be as clear as I can. Um, I am speaking directly into it, but so let me uh, let me continue. So again, to put this in perspective, what the Prime Minister was revealing was not something new, not something that was unknown. It was known that the Iranians had been experimenting with nuclear weapons, even though they denied it. Uh, it was known that they were they were engaging in different kinds of experiments, <clears throat> and uh, with regard, <clears throat> excuse me, with regard to 
um, uh, the steps you would have to take if you're actually going to take a bomb to produce a bomb. This is not related to what they were doing with centrifuges. Centrifuges provide enriched uranium. Enriched uranium can provide fuel for a reactor to power a reactor if you want to generate electricity, or it can provide fuel if you want to provide the, the core of a nuclear weapon. But to create a nuclear weapon from you from enriched uranium, you have to be able to create a chain reaction that would produce an explosion. And for that, you need to use neutron initiators, which create a certain separation. Uh, for that, you need to create a, a, use, create a kind of medical sphere so you can wrap it into a bomb. They were not, in other words, just building centrifuges to enrich uh, uranium. They were also engaging in actual experiments over the very uh, the very techniques you would need to build a bomb, and they were also engaging in computer simulations uh, and computer design and computer modeling of what it would take to produce a bomb. So this was actually known. What was new about the, the revelations uh, that the Prime Minister conveyed was the scope of it, the breadth of it, uh, how much work had gone into it, uh, the sheer volume of the material uh, made it very clear that this was a very determined effort over a number of years. Now, it is true that most of the effort stopped in 2003, around the time, not long after the American invasion of Iraq, when, by the way, the Iranians were concerned that they might be next, and they didn't want to create any kind of provocation. Now, the truth is the experimentation uh, was no longer driven in the same systematic way after 2003, but according to the IEA, it went on until 2009. The significance of the revelations is, as I suggested, just how expansive the effort was, which went well beyond what, in fact, we had known uh, previously, number one. Number two, what the Iranians did is they took all this material, all the work that embodied all the work that they had put into uh, developing a nuclear weapon, a nuclear bomb, a nuclear explosive device, to use the actual terminology, they put all of that uh, in all these materials, and they put them into a se separate warehouse in a secret location, obviously in a well-guarded place. Now, what's interesting is they did this after the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action went into force, uh, and after the agreement and after it went into force. Now, the significant thing here is the Iranians in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action committed in the preamble of that agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action being the Iran nuclear deal, they committed in the preamble of that never to seek, acquire, or to develop a nuclear weapon. Now, they, had, they don't say in here they had never done it, but that's what they had verbalized repeatedly. They did not come clean on their possible military dimensions of this program. They allowed a one-time visit to Parchin, where we know that they had been engaging in experiments with neutron initiators, uh, even though the IAEA wasn't allowed itself to go in and take soil samples. It was allowed to watch through cameras as the Iranians took soil samples soil samples as they were directed by the IAEA. When the IAEA got the soil samples, what they discovered were uranium particles, which further confirmed that, in fact, the Iranians had been conducting these experiments. So the significant thing is not just an understanding of, the, of how much uh, the Iranians were invested in this vast effort to produce a nuclear weapon. Uh, and even if it stopped, largely stopped, uh, by 2009, what is interesting is, given the JCPOA, where they commit to never seek, pursue, or acquire a nuclear weapon, why didn't they simply destroy all this material? Why were they saving all this material? It's hard to escape the conclusion that they were preserving it as an option, uh, which betrays the very purpose of what the JCPOA was all about. The significance, therefore, of what the Prime Minister was doing uh, in revealing all this was that it wasn't just that, you know, the... Ambassador Ross, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Do you, you want me to stop? 
are people still not hearing? Um, Ambassador Ross, we're having trouble hearing you. Are you still on the line? I, should, I, uh, should I call in again? Would that help? I'm not having any trouble hearing him at all. Oh, I'm, I'm hearing you. Well, I can, should I keep going? It breaks up a little bit. Uh, you get Sorry, everyone. Looks like we're having a technical glitch. We'll get back on in just a moment. There's no difficulty hearing him. Well, some people are hearing me and some people are not. Uh, and I don't know what else I can do about that. Uh, I'll continue until then. Maybe we'll go to questions uh, sooner. Uh, anyway, what I'm suggesting is that the the most significant impact of the revelations is that the Iranians were maintaining the full, all of the research, all of the simulations, all of the computer modeling that they had done on nuclear weapons, even though they had committed in the JCPOA never to seek, acquire, or develop a weapon. So one can ask the question legitimately, uh, were they not by keeping this, were they not betraying the very purpose of the deal? That's a different argument than the argument that's made by some that the whole deal was based on a lie. It's an argument that suggests that the, the basic Iranian intentions with the deal haven't changed, that they are preserving the option of, pres of pursuing a nuclear weapon. The JCPOA basically defers their ability to act on that intention because until the year 2030, the Iranians cannot have on hand uh, even one bomb's worth of enriched uranium material. And they cannot, they cannot uh, produce, uh, they cannot use the new, they have five new models of centrifuges. They can deploy those starting in year 10, which is 2025, but the output still is limited to one bomb's worth of material. The problem is they are permitted a very large nuclear infrastructure after 2015 with really no limitation on the size of the quality. They are permitted to deploy the five new centrifuges, which they will have been able to do R&D on starting even, beginning even in, in the end of 2023. Uh, they will perfect their, those five new models so that their output will be dramatically greater. Uh, and they won't have given up uh, the not just the knowledge base. The knowledge base is one thing. Once you have the knowledge, it's there. You can't remove it. But they won't have, they won't have given up all the computer modeling, uh, all the software they developed. Uh, and you know, that sh you know, even, if the, uh, even if the British, French, Germans, uh, Russians, and Chinese do not uh, feel that we should not walk away from the deal because if anything, these revelations show that at a minimum, minimum the Iranians have been, are, are deferred from pursuing this, and that's a useful thing. The one thing that should exist, if nothing else, is that there should be a destruction. There should, be, there should now be a hard questioning by the IAEA with the Iranian leadership uh, over, over these materials. Uh, there should be a verifiable destruction of all the relevant software and related hardware that was produced for this. And I would say this is a good time. It, it should create leverage on us to go to the British and the French and Germans at least and say if nothing else what this demonstrates is a real need to extend the life of the limitations. You've heard the term sunset provisions. What that means, the limitations on enrichment, the limitations on the size of the, of the nuclear program that's permitted, uh, that those limitations should not end in 2030. Now, I would argue it, that at least for another 10 years that those limitations should not come off, meaning until 2040. Uh, and that should be one of the outcomes of this. If, if, uh, if nothing else, these revelations should give us new leverage to focus on Iranian intentions, uh, and these revelations should, uh, should therefore also, um, should also be something that we use to, at a minimum, get the IEA to go to the Iranians and say, all right, look, uh, all the work you did on nuclear weapons uh, needs to be exposed uh, to us, uh, and it needs to be destroyed. Now, I can go on, and, and why don't I take a few more minutes and just talk about what's been going on in Syria. 
uh, and my concerns about that, and then we'll turn over to your questions. And I hope you've been able to hear most of this. All right, so what we've seen in Syria with Iran since February is that Iran has become much less risk averse. Uh, what they did in the first week in February is they sent a drone, an armed drone, uh, from, the, from a base in the center of Syria that was manned largely by the Iranians, but there were also Russians co-located at the base. Uh, they sent a drone, they flew it over uh, Jordan, and then it crossed into Israel. It was in Israeli airspace for 90 seconds, and it was shot down. The Israelis actually followed it from the moment it was launched and followed it its, the entire, its entire path. And the Israelis retaliated. Uh, for what was really a brazen Iranian act to, uh, to do something directly. It's out of Iranian, Iran's character to threaten the Israelis directly. They always do it indirectly. They do it through proxies. They do it through terror groups. They do it through Hezbollah. But they don't tend to do it themselves directly. Here they were doing it directly. So Israel responded with what was a, uh, a retaliation where they took out the mobile command post that uh, really a van that had... Uh, directed, guided the drone. Uh, they also took out three other fixed sites at the same base that were part of the command control of the Iranians on the base. Now, there was a barrage of surface-to-air missiles in response. One of these Israeli aircraft over, the goal, over, over Israel, not over Syria, not over Lebanon, one of the Israeli aircraft was, um, was destroyed uh, by that. The pilots survived by bailing out. It was subsequently learned that the lessons learned showed that it was actually pilot error that produced this downed aircraft, which was the first aircraft down, Israeli aircraft lost a hostile fire since 1982. Uh, what the Israelis did in the aftermath of losing that plane was to show there was a price for that, and with no other losses, they took out half of all the Syrian air defenses. Now, the Israelis, um, they haven't admitted the following, but it is reported that the Israelis this week, um, I should say, that the Israelis on April 9th, on April 9th, the Israelis, uh, again, even though they hadn't admitted it, they took out uh, a base, again, the same one. They took out a, a base where, uh, where the Iranians were, uh, and this had less to do with the drone and more to do with weapons being stockpiled at the base, surface-to-surface -surface missiles probably, but uh, it you know, may not have been only that. But in any case, uh, the Israelis acted and took, it, and took out this base, uh, and it was the Russians who added the Israelis. Now, why is that significant? Um, the Israelis never admit that they carry out these strikes, and they, they don't, they, the reason they don't admit it uh, is that it doesn't put the Iranians on the spot to respond. If you declare responsibility for something like that and, and Iranian forces get killed in the process, it creates a pressure for them to do something about it. When the Russians outed uh, the Israelis, they put the Iranians in a position where they had to do something about it. In, that, in the April 9th raid, seven officers of the Quds forces, the Quds forces are the action arm of the Revolutionary Guard, Seven officers of the Quds forces uh, were, uh, uh, were, were killed. Uh, and in the course, in, in the aftermath of that, after the Russians had publicized this, the Iranians then gave great fan for this. They gave great coverage to, uh, to the funerals of these seven officers, and they declared the, uh, uh, a number of leading Iranian officials declared they would retaliate against Israel. They haven't done it yet, but it's clear the Israelis expect a retaliation. Now, this week, earlier this week, there was another strike that, again, is reported to have been the Israelis uh, at a base in Hama, and at two bases, actually, one in Hama and one north of Aleppo. Again, the Israelis have not admitted anything, but, it is, but the uh, published reports and some off the record, or at least not a senior American officials, not name, but and not seeking attribution, said this was again the Israelis. Uh, why anyone here would be saying that is beyond me. Uh, we can get into why the Russians out of the Israelis. I can explain that, but we'll do that in the Q and A. Uh, this more recent attack that is attributed to the Israelis, but again not acknowledged by the Israelis, 
again, killed a number of Iranians. And this one seems to have been related, uh, again, to what may be weapons uh, that could be very threatening to Israel uh, if, in fact, they were transferred to Hezbollah or even if they were used by Hezbollah or other Shia militias uh, in uh, in Syria against Israel. It's possible that also the reason for what was done was that the Israelis picked up the possibility that uh, an attack with rockets was being readied from that base against Israel. That's also a possibility. In any case, what all this highlights is there is, we are on, I believe, a collision course between Israel and Iran and its growing presence uh, in Syria with tens of thousands of Shia militia who, are, who have been brought into Syria by the Iranians. The Iranians seem determined to build uh, a very deep, wide military presence with bases and infrastructure, supporting infrastructure throughout Syria. The Israelis seem to be just as determined to ensure that they can't do that and recreate in Syria what they've already created in Lebanon, where there's 120,000 Hezbollah rockets. One clear red line for these Israelis is not just creating that equivalent place in uh, or position in Syria as to what they have in Lebanon, the fundamental red line, which Israel truly can't live with, is if the Iranians are able to put uh, advanced guidance systems on the rockets that they provided to Hezbollah. Now those rockets are not guided. They are, they are governed basically by a ballistic missile path, which means based on the propulsion and the payload, payload, they go to a certain height and then gravity takes them down to a point. It's not guided. If they put guidance systems on these rockets, uh, then every single strategic target in Israel could be vulnerable. Notwithstanding Israel's uh, layered missile defense, you know, when you're talking about 120 to 150,000 rockets, even though not all of them have great range, the fact is that kind, those kinds of numbers can swamp uh, any defensive system, any defensive missile array. So Israel really can't live with it, and that's why what they're doing, they're trying to signal the Iranians and the Russians, not with words, but with actions, uh, about the dangerous path they're on. My own view, and I've written and, and publicly said this, is that so long as the Trump administration remains on the sidelines, focused in Syria on ISIS, but not on Iran, uh, focus very much on the JCPOA, uh, but not on what the Iranians are actually doing in the region, uh, and not doing much to counter it, uh, this path is likely to continue. Now, uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo was out there and he talked about the Iranian threat in the region. He talked about supporting uh, the Israelis and their rights to, to self-defense and, and working with the Saudis and others in the region. The key thing here is what is the U.S. doing to convince the Russians that if they do not contain the further spread of Iran and Syria, that it will draw us back in. The president's made it clear he wants to get out of Syria. Well, that's a message that doesn't strengthen deterrence right now. Uh, the one thing that could strengthen deterrence would be convincing the Russians that uh, if they don't do something to prevent the further spread, I'm not saying roll back the Iranians, but to, to contain the further spread of the Iranians and Shia militias within Syria, this kind of a scenario, which could easily broaden into a regional war, because one thing that is guiding the Iranians is a presumption that they can create pressure on Israel and Israel can't provide, can, can, cannot produce an equivalent pressure on them, meaning you know, from Syria and Lebanon, they can threaten Israel in a way that they're far removed from. Well, Israel will never operate that way. They're not going to allow them to create or orchestrate a war against them where they could face 2,000 rockets a day and Iran stands immune, stands aloof, far from this. If something like this were to materialize, if this was a kind of war that could happen, and I do believe we're headed down that path unless something is done, uh, Israel will, will hit Iran. Uh, and Iran can't do more against Israel than what it has Hezbollah doing with, as I said, 120,000 rockets. Uh, so, you know, Iran may well then decide to hit, you know, hit Saudi Arabia. Well, then you're, you're kind of off to the races you can see how such a war starts. You don't see how it ends very easily. And, it's, and that would suck in the United States uh, in circumstances uh, that are much worse and where the options are more limited. So we have an interest in convincing the Russians that if they don't contain the Iranians, we will before this kind of broader scenario that I'm outlining uh, unfolds. I don't think it's right around the corner, but no one should have high confidence that 
anything that starts off as uh, a kind of tit for tat between Israel and the Iranians is something that's going to remain uh, limited. It's the potential for escalation is quite high, and I think the the more that we focus on uh, how you contain the Iranians and how you give the Russians, who are clearly the principal actor right now within Syria, uh, more of a stake in doing that, uh, I think we're you know, we we may well see this collision course actually materialize and not just be a theoretical possibility. You know, one last point. Uh, what the president does on May 12th with, with regard to the JCPOA, and there's no doubt that the prime minister was clearly trying to create more momentum behind the decision to walk away from the JCPOA. Uh, walking away from JCPOA uh, may also, I mean, there's different ways that the Iranians could respond to it, and maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A, but I don't want to take up too much more time talking now, so why don't I stop there and I'll take your questions, and I hope that you have heard most of that. Thank you so much, Ambassador Ross, for that very informative briefing. Uh, we have turned the Q&A on, so if you have a question, please press star six to be added to the queue. Um, Ambassador Ross, as you alluded to while we're waiting for the questions to come in, can you explain more uh, Russia's ro role within, um, within the scenario that you just went through? Um, what is Russia's role vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Israel and Iran for, for those who are trying to get a handle on all the different actors? And what do you think the different options are for the U.S., like you said, to try to convince Russia to contain Iran. Okay, so let me start by saying, explaining why did the Russians out the Israelis on the April 9th uh, attack? Well, I think there were two reasons. The first reason is that the Russians were co-located at the base. The Israelis didn't coordinate with the, have a deconfliction channel with the, with the Russians. I don't think they turned that one on or alerted them. And even though the Israeli attack was very precise, didn't didn't touch the Russians at all. I think for Putin, this was a message. This was too close, and he was, in a sense, sense saying this was not acceptable. Um, that was point one. Point two was this, this took place two days after the Assad Duma chemical weapons attack. And I think Putin wanted to show this was not the Americans who done it, because for Putin, he wants to be seen as being the main arbiter of events. Uh, in Syria and using that as a springboard to become, if not the main, a, a central arbiter of events in the Middle East as a whole. He has created a position in Syria now for Russia that even the Soviet Union didn't have. They never had an air base there, but he has an air base there. Uh, he's created a, more of an a air defense umbrella over, Eastern over the Eastern Mediterranean than the, Russian, than the Soviets ever had. So he wants to be seen as a central arbiter, uh, not only in Syria, but he wants to use that even beyond Syria. And an American use of power to affect things is not what he wants to see. Ironically, when we did retaliate for the chemical weapons usage, the, the nature of our re retaliation was so narrow, so limited, uh, only hit those sites that weren't close to the Russians, which had come after Russian threats about how they might retaliate if the U.S. did anything. Uh, this basically told the Russians that they had deterred a more significant American response. So the key at this point in my mind, particularly because Putin wants to be seen as the main arbiter of events, is for him to understand that at a time when, when the president has declared we're getting out of Syria, I mean, there were news reports that he wanted to get out in 48 hours and that the Secretary of Defense persuaded him to make it six months. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard now from others. Macron is talking about six months uh, based on his conversations. Uh, for the Russians, having us leave Syria is a win. Uh, one of the things we could do is to make it clear, look, if you don't stop the, the spread of the Iranian position uh, in Syria and, and all the risks that are going to be attendant to that, we will use our, par our air power to do it. And bear in mind, the Russians never had more than 50 airplanes in Syria, and yet they secured Assad, they changed the balance of power on the ground, they basically uh, have set the opposition dramatically back uh, with 50 aircraft. We have 500 aircraft that are not only more numerous, but qualitatively superior. We could, we could use our air power to blunt the expansion of the Iranians. I'm not saying roll them back because to roll them back, you have to go on the ground. That's a mistake. We shouldn't do that. But every, you know, we can make it clear to the Russians, if you don't do it, we will. Uh, every time we see them begin to move from where they are to try to expand out, we'll stop it. 
I don't see Putin wanting the U.S. to be acting that way. And Putin has an interest in addition not to suck us back in, but actually to have us leave. So we should be engaging the Russians that way and making it clear. And you don't have to say it publicly. If you say it publicly, you put them on the spot. You communicate it to, the, to them privately, and, uh, and I think that would be, this is the best way to blunt the, the collision course that I see beginning to emerge. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to take our first caller. Uh, Ambassador, what is your assessment of the seriousness of France, Germany, the UK, and even the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, regarding uh, these uh, Israeli revelations? Um, and uh, uh, isn't this really um, uh, doesn't this really dovetail? with the administration's statements regarding uh, additional follow-on demands and sanctions with respect to Iranian missiles development and, and their meddling in uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, and the like? Well, I think uh, the British, the French, and the Germans, I put that in a separate category than the IAEA. The IAEA's role is simply to, is basically to monitor uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, and as I was suggesting, to get, you know, to have serious discussions now about all these materials and also what's and they're and dispensing with them. The British, French, and the Germans have been negotiating with the administration to address concerns in four areas that the administration raised. One of the sunset provisions of the JCPOA, meaning the limitations that lapse on enrichment and the kind of output and the, and the size of the uh, nuclear program that Iran can have after, uh, after 2030. Two uh, is, the, um, is the ballistic missile program and, uh, and raising the costs on that by sanctioning it. Three uh, are inspections, uh, widening the inspections or at least making it clear that the military bases in Iran are not off limits, uh, although the JCPOA makes it pretty clear that any undeclared site the Iranians have to allow access to if we provide information that justifies our suspicions of those sites. And the fourth thing is raising the cost to the Iranians of what they're doing in the region. Now, the, the, uh, Macron came here, Merkel came here, uh, Theresa May will be coming here. Clearly, Macron made a real effort to try to persuade the president not to walk away from the deal and he seemed to say afterwards that he thought he was going to walk away from the deal. Uh, I still believe that, I mean, the one thing that is that these revelations may have done, even though the French Foreign Ministry has already come out and said, you know, the revelations just demonstrate that, that all the more importance of preserving the JCPOA, although the one thing the French have added is this does uh, give us a reason to look again at the importance of extending the limitations. So that relates to the sunset provisions. What I see is if the administration walks away, um, I think they're going to walk away alone. Uh, and, and I think the Iranians will play on the fears of the Europeans in particular uh, that they will resume their program in a way that creates the danger of a march towards war uh, to stop them. Because once they resume their program, then that moves them closer to back towards a nuclear weapon that otherwise has been put on hold at least till 2030. So I think that the, the key here is, can the administration take advantage of what I think is some new leverage that the Israeli disclosures, revelations have provided? And to do that, to, to press for something more than what the, Iranian, what the Europeans were prepared to do in the sunset provisions. The Europeans were prepared to do sanctions on the ballistic missiles, prepared to make a statement uh, that military facilities are not off limits, and prepared to uh, designate Hezbollah for the first time, the entirety of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, and talk to us about other sanctions on their behavior in the region. Uh, but the sunset provision, because it was at the core of the trade-offs in the deal, that they were most reluctant to go beyond just making a general statement. Now they might be prepared to go beyond and insist on, look, uh, maybe this should be extended for another 10 years in any case. And the Iranians, given the fact that there is there are real signs of alienation within Iran, 
they may not be able, they might may not be as prone to simply say no and reject that. Uh, so I do think there's a potential opening there. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to take our next caller. Mr. Ambassador, uh, can you hear me? I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Uh, on the assumption that Syria has um, given uh, permission uh, to Iran to open up a new front against Israel from its territory using uh, Shia militia and, uh, uh, I guess, in the future, uh, more sophisticated Iranian uh, military uh, equipment and technology. Uh, to what extent have the Russians uh, been pulled into or willingly uh, acceded to this um, a joint Syrian-Iranian project? And I specifically refer to the threat that I think the Russian foreign minister made to Israel a week or two ago in connection with Russia's promised transfer of, I think it's called an S-400 anti-aircraft system uh, the, to Syria. The S-300s. Yeah, it's the S-300s S-300. to yeah. Syria, not 400, to Syria. And then uh, the Israeli uh, for, uh, Defense Minister Lieberman's response to the Russian right. threat. Um, I think we have to look at the Russians in a kind of dual way. Uh, on the one hand, they have abetted Iranian power and the spread of Iranian power so far within Syria. On the other hand, they have the deconfliction line with the Israelis has been has worked. I mean, you have, to, you have to understand. Prime Minister Netanyahu has made seven trips to see Putin in the last 17 months. He had two objectives. One was to do deconfliction to be sure the Israelis and Russians didn't get into any conflict uh, yeah, in Syria, and the other was to convince uh, Putin to contain what the Iranians were doing. On the former, with regard to the confliction, that's been very successful. On the latter, it obviously has not worked. And the question you're asking is, how complicit are the, are the Russians in all this? Uh, and here I would say it's a, it's a marriage of tactical convenience right now. The reason the Russians, in my mind, are not separating themselves from the Iranians is that the insurgency within Syria has not stopped. While Assad is secure now, while they're taking back territory, the insurgency has not ended. And the Iranian and, and, the, and the Shia militias represent for the Russians boots on the ground. The Russians have a small footprint uh, in Syria. They want to keep the cost of their, uh, their presence low. They want to minimize the danger of Russian casualties. And so the the boots on the ground are Shia militias. So so long as that's the case, it's in Russian interest to continue not to separate themselves from the Iranians. The question becomes, if the Iranians are beginning to threaten Russian interests, can that be changed? And my guess is, I mean, I would say yes, because Putin is a, Putin is very riveted on on his gains and he's very transactional. Uh, the problem is we, at this point, haven't made it clear that there's a consequence for actions that he doesn't want to see. Throughout the Obama administration, we would make threats, but they were hollow. Uh, and I would say uh, President Trump has met with Putin twice. Twice he's had, they've, made, they've issued joint statements on Syria. On, in neither occasion have the Russians fully lived up to those agreements, and there's, and there's been no consequence. So... So long as the Russians don't see a consequence, then their position with the Assad regime and with the Iranians is going to be what we've seen to date. It doesn't mean it can't change. It doesn't mean that there's a kind of deeper intrinsic interest with what the Iranians are doing, but there is a, a tactical interest, and so long as there isn't a, he doesn't see the costs uh, related to what they're doing, Putin is unlikely to change. Thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that if you have a question, please dial star six. Uh, we're going to take our next question. Yes, has there been uh, independent confirmation of the Israeli intelligence findings, or is this underway, or can it be put underway? 
I don't think there's any, I mean, outside the Iranians, I don't think there's anyone who's really questioning this. The, the, the Israelis gave us these materials months ago, it's like 55,000 documents. So it takes time to go through them. The Israelis have now, I think, they, you know, they're turning them over to the British and the French, and they're turning them over to the IEA as well. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the Israelis could have turned the material over earlier and given them more time to go through this. But I don't think, we've already come out and said these, these are completely authentic. Uh, so, you know, having, having others do that, I think, will add to the weight and impact of this. But uh, I don't think there's much questioning about the authenticity of these. Great. Thank you. We're going to our next question. Um, does the uh, evidence of the uh, Israeli attacks in Syria indicate air superiority and that uh, the, the uh, level of safety within Israel it can be preserved or not? Well, I don't know exactly what you're asking. Uh, if you're asking, most of the Israeli strikes basically are not into Syrian airspace. They're all standoff strikes from like over Lebanon or elsewhere. Uh, they use aircraft with um, basically with air-to-ground munitions and precision-guided munitions. In some cases, they'll, they themselves will, the Israelis will use surface-to-surface -surface rockets. Uh, there is, as I was saying before, if you're dealing with 120,000 rockets out of Hezbollah, there is no way to stop all those. The, the virtue of, of Iron Dome and David Sling and the Arrow is that they, especially Iron Dome, they have the ability to discriminate. If something is hitting, if, some, if a missile or rocket is headed towards a, a target that needs to be defended, it's a civilian target, uh, then, then you can fire it. Um, if it's going towards an open area of, uh, of no consequence, you let it hit, so you don't waste the defensive missiles. The problem with the, the size of the rocket arsenal in Lebanon, and which is now being added to in Syria, uh, is that no defensive system, no matter how sophisticated and integrated, is going to be able to handle all that, and they will try to saturate it. Uh, it, it, require, it will require the Israelis using a variety of different you know, approaches, including going in on the ground. They'll use cyber. They'll go into the ground. It's a it's a full, comprehensive approach. But then that's you know that's a pretty, that's not a limited conflict. So, if you're saying can Israel protect its airspace, uh, it cannot stop every rocket that would be fired into Israel. And if you're being hit with a thousand or fifteen hundred a day or even two thousand, uh, you know that's the reality is that that uh, many may penetrate. The question is whether you can stop those that would be hitting. Um, civilian targets or significant military targets, uh, and what does it take to be able to do that, uh, and how long will it take to stop um, stop such an onslaught? Uh, so, I mean, that's the that's really the response to your question, if that's what you're asking. Great, thank you so much for going to our next caller. Hello, Ambassador. Uh, you mentioned about the importance, perhaps, of America changing uh, Russia's understanding of our response. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and also on your um, mentioning about stopping the missiles from becoming guided missiles as opposed to the kind of general missiles that they are now? Well, what I was saying is uh, we have made it clear we want to get out of uh, – out of Syria. To date, our position, everything we've done in Syria, none of it has been geared against the Iranians. There have been a couple of instances where uh, Shia militias moved towards positions where we were, where we had small, small contingents of special forces with the, uh, with the Kurdish forces, uh, in, primarily in eastern Syria, but there was one occasion more in southern Syria. Uh, and uh, we went, worked through the Russians because there's a we too have a guy in a deconfliction mechanism with the Russians uh, to warn them to stop, and they didn't stop. Uh, and in one case, they opened fire, and we took we took out these convoys completely. But we have reacted only, and we've done nothing to actually 
initiate any kind of attacks against Iranian or Shia militia forces uh, against anything they were doing. We have left, in effect, we have left, we put the Israelis on their own. They have been left on their own to counter Iran within Syria. So what I'm saying is, uh, without us having to do it, we have to get the Russians to do it. The only way to get the Russians to do it is for the Russians, for Putin to realize that uh, rather than us getting out of Syria, if the Iranians keep doing what they're doing, they might suck us back not only into Syria, but they could trigger a much wider war that will suck us into the region. Uh, it, imagine, if you will, that this, this war begins and there are thousands of rockets being fired out of uh, Lebanon and Syria and Israel. Israel retaliates in both places, but it keeps on going. The Iranians you know, may have been responsible for triggering all this, but they're sitting off in Iran feeling that you know, they can pressure Israel, impose a price on Israel, and Israel can't impose a price on them. So I've often said about the Iranians, they're quite happy to fight to the last of the Shia militias, as long as it stays removed from them. All right, so at some point, the Israelis basically say, we're going to impose a price on Iran for what they're doing. They need to see that this causes them, this, this causes them pain, not just us. Let's say the Israelis were to you know, hit targets within Iran. Maybe they would hit oil targets, the oil facilities in Iran. What does Iran do in response? They can't do anything more themselves against Israel because their own distance, what the Hezbollah is doing and what the, what's being done from Syria and Lebanon, given the numbers of rockets, they can't add to in any material way. So they might choose to hit uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. If Iran's ability to export oil might be affected, well, they're not going to be the only ones. So under those circumstances, you'll see us have to get involved again to try to, to stop that. Uh, and the point here is that to say to, we shouldn't want that scenario to unfold. We should act to preempt it, to stop it, to deter it. Uh, and one way is to basically go to Putin privately and say, here's where things are heading. Rather than us getting out of the region, this is going to suck us in. That's the last thing you want. You actually want to see us leave? All right, but, you know, we're not going to leave if this is what's going to happen. So that's what I was trying to explain. Now, with regard to the, with regard to the, putting advanced guidance systems on a rocket, a rocket that is fired that has, that has no guidance, but, it just, but gravity determines where it comes down, uh, it can't hit targets. It just, it's, it's truly a terror weapon. All it's good for is to fire it in and hope it hits civilian areas. Uh, a, a rocket that has an advanced guidance system on it can be directed it won't have perfect accuracy, but it's what's you know, they could create what are known. It's called circular error, error probable of like 50 meters. Well, you know, hitting a going for a target and being within 50 meters of its you know, of of where it is. If you you know you decide to hit a military base, you decide to hit a power plant. Uh, you know, you decide to hit uh, command control centers. Um, if you have accuracy to 50 meters, you can hit those targets. And Israel can't live with that. Israel is a small country you know, with a relatively limited number of high-value targets, both civilian economic, uh, but also military. So when Israel says it won't tolerate, it won't live with it, it's true. They really can't. Uh, so that's what I mean by all that. Thank you so much. Um, we just got another question emailed to us. Um, Ambassador Ross, looking ahead at mid-May, in addition to President Trump's decision whether to waive sanction vis-a-vis -vis the Iran deal by May 12th, the U.S. has also announced their plan to move the American embassy in Israel to Jerusalem on May 14th, uh, which is also the date of Hamas's planning of its Nakba Day march. Can you comment on how these events uh, relate to each other, influence each other, and if there's things that we should look out for or expect in the short term as we get closer to these uh, upcoming two weeks? Well, Nakba Day will be the day after. It'll be on May 15th. Nakba Day, Nakba in Arabic means catastrophe. This is what the Palestinians, they regard the, the founding of Israel led to a catastrophe for them. And Hamas has declared that they would you know, they would uh, foment these, they would carry out these demonstrations, which are clearly more than just demonstrations, in Gaza going to the fence, actually trying to breach the fence. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to breach the fence. They, this last Friday, they actually, you know, it, it wasn't the, you know, the other thousands who showed up who might have been peaceful. There were several hundred who, in a very 
uh, organized, planned way, uh, you know, almost in a, in a military fashion, sought to breach the fence using the cover of smoke and burning tires uh, to try to uh, blind the you know, the IDF that was there. Uh, so the idea is they want to they want to build to a kind of culmination on May 15th, which is the day after the embassy. So they're looking at the opening of the American embassy on the one hand and Nakbade on the other to create a kind of real crescendo uh, and hope to play upon real Palestinian passions and anger uh, to trigger something much wider than we've seen so far on the events that are taking place uh, in Gaza every Friday. And um, I don't think we should, dis we should dismiss the possibility that uh, this could be a couple of ugly days. Okay, we have time for one last caller. Ambassador, thank you for uh, for being with us. What about the other Arab countries? Do they have any role to play in this? Well, they do have a role to play in it. Uh, here again, I would say uh, the key is the more we want them to play a role. Look, you've seen over even though it's not public, even though it's below the radar screen, the level of cooperation between the Sunni Arab leaders and Israel in operational matters, in intelligence matters, in counter-terror matters, uh, is unprecedented because they see common threats. Uh, now, the Arabs, you know, the Arab leaders, you know, they, they won't take this to a visible level in any significant way unless the Palestinian issue is dealt with because that's still an issue that they believe can mobilize their publics against them. You know, the issue is a, it's, you know, obviously it's been socialized over the last 70 years in a certain way, but in addition, you know, it's seen uh, in the region as, a, as an issue that relates to a basic injustice that needs to be addressed. Having said that, they also understand that Israel, is, in their eyes, is a major bulwark against the main enemy they see, meaning the Iranians. So from that standpoint, they are doing things with the Israelis, and, then, and they can do more against the Iranians who they see as, as the main threat. But they're likely to do, they, they will do more the more they see that the U.S. is actually prepared to take steps to contain the Iranians. What they don't see right now uh, is that the U.S. is doing that. Uh, look, the Trump administration is certainly much tougher in its words towards the Iranians. It's prepared to to do things that uh, you know the Iranians clearly don't like, uh, and and yet its posture towards Iran has been more rhetorical than anything else to this point. Uh, and if we want to see Arab leaders do more, uh, one of the ways to do that is to say, here's what we're going to do to contain the spread of the Iranians throughout the region. Here's what we require from you to do it. That way you can actually draw them into doing more than they're doing now uh, and, and I think make our own efforts that much more successful. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Dennis Ross, for speaking with us and giving this uh, giving us this important and sobering analysis. And really thank you all for joining us. Please join us again for future calls and programs featuring a variety of experts, policymakers, and thought leaders on issues of significance to the U.S., Israel, and the global community. For those of you who are in the greater D.C. area, please join the JCRC this Monday night, May 7th, at our offices in North Bethesda for our annual meeting, where we will feature a panel discussion on challenges and opportunities facing progressive Zionists, with political strategist Ann Lewis, Zionist founder Amanda Berman, and LGBTQIA activist Chris McCannell, moderated by the president and CEO of JCPA, David Bernstein. You can find information about that event, as well as a link to listen to a recording of this call on our website, www.jcouncil.org. We will also be distributing the link in the JCRC's weekly email, which is going out momentarily. And we encourage you all to share it with your friends and colleagues. I want to thank Alexis Schwartz, Associate Director of the Israel Action Center at the JCRC for helping to organize this briefing. And thank you all again for being on this very important call.